All right, hi, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us at the end of the day. Uh, we're Maria Noen from Red Hat. We represent the product team and the business side, uh, as well as engineering today. And we're gonna talk about how to modernize the Red Hat OpenStack platform uh, for your operational experience with Kubernetes. Um, I will first like to say that this is a sponsor session, so it will be heavy on the Red Hat part of the, um, you know, of the product. So if we talk about OpenStack, it will be Red Hat OpenStack, and if we talk about Kubernetes, it will be in the form of OpenShift. Um, needless to say, it still mirrors very much what both communities are doing. So with that, um, so let's start. So I represent the business side, so we're gonna talk a little bit about strategy. So Red Hat has been around for 28 years, and in those 28 years, we have caused a lot of disruption in the open source community and uh, provided a lot of value and innovation to customers and partners. So we want to, um, you know, that's very close to, to where we are. It's part of our strategy, but it's also part of how we work and how we bring together and collaborate with transparency, meritocracy, shape our business uh, practices, as well as the organizational culture. Um, in the past few years, we have seen companies accelerate their move um, to um, uh, more cloud-centric services, either ship based on the pandemic or because that shift was coming already. Um, and our uh, strategy and our vision has grown, not just from the data center um, to the cloud, but also to the edge. And if you, if you see that, um, OpenStack represents sort of the base of that hybrid platform over here. Um, and then we see that strategy growing all the way to the edge, of course, following open source principles, collaborating uh, with companies. And uh, our latest release, OpenStack 16.2, uh, we made sure that we had features and values that you know, represented uh, a good standing for, for the workloads that our customers were deploying. Um, so in OpenStack, uh, what can you use OpenStack for? What can you use this open hybrid edge uh, for? Obviously, um, you can use it for clouds uh, in the telco uh, space. We, we've heard about that a lot, and I will talk a little bit more about that here. But it's not just telco. It, it includes AI, ML uh, workloads, like we saw in the presentation earlier today, as well as public clouds and to run container-based workloads, uh, all sorts of um, different use cases. We have invested a lot in the telco, uh, I guess, vertical, and our customers are really what drive our investments. So we have been a leader in the telco digital transformation. Um, you know, you can see that here, both from the infrastructure side, being sort of the base for 4G, and that's OpenStack has been the base for that, where we're also uh, a big part of the core that supports the 5G deployments uh, going forward. Um, all of this is also double clicking on the Loki message that the foundation has been talking about um, today and as, as part of the summit of Linux, OpenStack, and Kubernetes coming together. Again, for us, it will be uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Red Hat OpenStack, and OpenShift coming together to support all of these um, use cases, but in particular uh, with telcos. So bringing some examples, all of these have press releases and press announcements, either from analysts, from our customers, uh, or from Red Hat. Um, all of these represent different use cases of how this Loki stack has been deployed in production and is currently running. It has been for the last, uh, you know, uh, more than five years, and it continues to be what drives us moving forward. Um, in particular, I wanted to double click on Turk Telecom, who's a trusted um, partner, customer, um, messaging that Red Hat has been key part of their digital transformation. And it's not just Red Hat OpenStack, although that's a big part of it, but it's also all the rest of the Red Hat services coming together. Um, it has helped balance the um, investment and made the transformation to digital a lot quicker. But we continue to talk to customers, and again, customers are the ones that are driving how we invest in, uh, in, um, in our open source projects, and then how we connect to the rest of the community to validate these use cases. So in that spirit, from the product team, we ask our customers and the market and, um, and analysts, et cetera, 
where, uh, you know, what describes your strategy? Because at Red Hat, that helps um, kind of shape where we're going and that informs our strategy decisions. We see that there's a lot of uh, investment in private cloud still, um, and a lot of investment in this hybrid multi-cloud. Uh, we see, again, OpenStack as being the base of the uh, on-prem kind of deployment, uh, but we see that combination happening in a lot of different ways. So I will show you a couple of use cases that are in production at our customers' uh, deployments, and uh, the names have been removed to protect the innocent uh, <laughs> and our commitment to, to them. Um, but for example, in this case, uh, the use case to solve or the problem to solve is 5G deployments, right? And we see in this case it being demonstrated as Red Hat ACM running with OpenStack Director, uh, the OpenStack controllers on one side with OpenStack running VMs or bare metal, and then OpenShift masters running a sort of side by side, um, you know, running on bare metal as well with OVN, and then out to the edge uh, and, uh, and LTE ran. This is what we call shift with stack, so open shift with OpenStack, both uh, platforms sort of running side by side. Again, this double clicks on what happened earlier in the keynotes where we talked about it's not one or the other, it's more an and, and sometimes it is side by side, sometimes one on top of each other. Um, this is, again, running in production. Uh, it shows uh, the benefits of running both platforms. Uh, it showcases AC, Red Hat ACM as that single plane that allows you to control and manage both. Um, the reasons for the side-by-side -side deployment could be a large deployment of OpenStack was already present, uh, didn't want to disrupt what was going on, and rather decided that workloads that were more cloud-native and needed uh, sort of OpenShift or Kubernetes to manage uh, the additional growth, we're going to run in OpenShift sort of side by side. Both clouds continue to run at the scale that they're needed, and, um, and that's addressed that way. Same problem, how do we solve the 5G question? Resolve for another use case in production as well with a different approach. So this approach is the shift on stack, so basically running OpenShift as a workload on top of OpenStack. Uh, in this case, uh, we also have Red Hat ACM and OSP Director running the um, OpenStack uh, control plane. We have OpenStack Computes running alongside uh, OCP workers, and we also have uh, OpenStack controllers and OpenShift masters uh, running together, uh, one with on the other. Uh, Again, the Loki stack represented one on top of each other, not just side by side. So we see also many other variations, but you continue to see the same thought. It is not one and the other. It depends on the use case, how we merge this uh, technologies together. Um, another technology that uh, we are sort of facing out is Rev, Red Hat Virtualization. Um, and in order to uh, continue to support our customers that run OpenStack, currently using Red Hat virtualization to virtualize the control plane of OpenStack, we invested in um, something that we call the director operator. So basically using uh, a, an operator running uh, an OpenShift uh, to be able to manage the deployment of the control plane of OpenStack running on OpenShift. So basically. Uh, virtualized control planes, virtualized controllers of OpenStack running on Kubernetes, OpenShift. And uh, we have that running today in Tech Preview in uh, OpenStack 16.2, so this is out and available, and we have a couple of customers running this in production today. We see a lot of requests for this kind of uh, deployment model so that customers can continue to run both OpenShift workloads and OpenStack, but also leveraging the virtualization of the control plane or sort of reducing the footprint to, to run the control plane and other services. This one had some of the usual suspects that you may um, recognize. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have Triple O, Heat, and Ansible sort of working together as part of that OpenStack client. And then the hardware provisioning side happens thanks to um, uh, Kubevert and Metal Cube. Uh, working together with 
both the Kubernetes community or internally with the OpenShift and OpenStack teams to pull this off to support our customers. But this is not where we start. I have shown you today what we have in production today, what we have supported today, but where we're going and the next step of how we continue this sort of modernization, uh, I'm gonna pass, pass this to Owen um, so he can cover what are we doing on an engineering side. Cool, thank you, Maria. So I'm Owen, I work with the engineering team um, that works on OpenStack at Red Hat. Um, now, obviously, as Maria has been explaining, we've been bringing our product through an evolution, uh, and a lot of that evolution is kind of built on the adjacencies between OpenStack and Kubernetes, or in our product terms, OpenStack and OpenShift, right? And we kind of overlap in various different ways. So I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit more detail um, about some of the efforts that we're doing in the engineering side to, um, to put flesh in the bones here and to make this a reality, essentially, right? So obviously this is a big effort, right? Internally, we've been talking about it as our, our next generation initiative, right? So we're gonna be putting a lot of work into this and it's, it's always good to kind of step back a bit uh, when you're kind of embarking on, a, on a, a big investment like this and to ask the question as to, you know, hey, if it ain't broke, right, why change it, yeah? And it isn't broken, right, is the, I guess, the, the overarching message from this slide. So OpenStack, uh, the, the Red Hat um, productization of it, it's currently at version 16.2, right? So we brought it through many major versions over, <clears throat> over the years. We have evolved the form factor of the product. We have evolved the deployment tooling, right? to the point of which it's a very mature offering, yeah? So basically, you've got a fair amount of, of um, you know, uh, options and freedom there, flexibility. You can deploy your control plane on bare metal. You can deploy it in a virtualized form on Rev, which, as Bria mentioned earlier, is a, a longstanding product um, that we are currently bringing to the end of its life. Um, we've got uh, a scenario whereby resilience and high availability and so on is provided by very mature tooling, including uh, Pacemaker and SystemD. Uh, our services have been containerized for many years, right? I think we brought this in, I might be corrected by some of the engineers in the audience, but uh, I think we brought it in OSP 12, possibly. So multiple releases into the past, it's, uh, it's a very mature and battle-hardened thing, right? So it's essentially all of our control plane services containerized and managed on the control plane nodes using Podman. Um, we've got a sophisticated set of tools to manage your day two operations in your data plane. You know, so what do you need to do? You need to be able to do scale out and upgrades and, and other day two operations. And they're all managed by OSP director, as we call it, which is essentially just our uh, distribution of triple O, right? And then we've had various different approaches to telemetry and observability that we have um, used over the years, right? So we've got a set of tools like Salometer, Noki, CollectD, uh, and various other uh, uh, you know, adjacent tools, right, that basically provide observability, but in a very open stack specific way. That's what I mean by bespoke here, right? Um, so it's basically uh, you know, something that's, that's very much open stack flavored, right? So that's where we're at, very mature scenario. Right, and it's worked very well for us, and it's brought a lot of success to our customers. Um, but what do we want to do differently? Well, essentially, the whole point of these next generation investments for us is around providing a more modernized operational experience for our customers, right? So essentially building upon the operational idioms that have grown up more recently, and are usually aligned with, uh, with Kubernetes, essentially, or, or OpenShift from our productization perspective. Uh, so what will this look like in, uh, in practical terms? Well, essentially, we'll take those uh, currently monolithic control plane nodes, right? And we'll kind of break them apart so that we'll end up with a, a set of fine-grained, potified control plane services that are distributed across your Kubernetes cluster. We'll build on and leverage uh, the simplicity of things like the operator framework in OpenShift. Um, we're for replication and failover, instead of using uh, very mature tooling like Pacemaker, 
which, you know, is kind of showing its age at this point. We use the simpler and more intuitive patterns around, for example, the, the replica set idiom in Kubernetes, right? And the last point there, I think, is, is really a, a, you know, a one that's kind of um, close to my heart, given my background with OpenStack. But we'll build a more unified observability mechanism that builds on kind of de facto industry standards and best practices that we see uh, right across uh, the industry. Right? So we'll build on things like Prometheus for metric storage. We'll adopt a, a variant of the node exporter pattern that, uh, that Kubernetes uses to export uh, metrics. And we'll use Kafka-based streaming to essentially stream metrics and logs and events and other pieces of observability data between multi-cluster deployments. Yeah? So that's essentially the modernization that we're going to provide. And this is all about incrementally building upon a proven model of success, something that's been out there for years and has worked very well for us and our customers. Uh, so up to now, I've kind of concentrated mainly on the control plane, right? But what about the data plane? What, what do we mean by the data plane? Well, essentially, it's the compute tier with other agents, for example, neutron agents, et cetera, uh, or you know, in your hyper-converged kind of storage mechanism, maybe um, some elements of um, Ceph, for example, that all run out on the compute tier, right? So essentially, we want to look at some of the pain points that have been surfaced up by our customers over time, right? These are things that um, basically could be done better within the product, or it could provide a better operational experience. Uh, so one thing we really want to do here is around this simplification agenda. Yeah? So Triple O is a very mature project. It's been around for a long time. Red Hat has supported it for a long time. Um, and over that time period, it's evolved to encompass multiple different tools. Right? Um, and this is you know, essentially making uh, the tool chain more capable, but obviously adding a bit of complexity as well. So we've added things over the years, like Mistral, like uh, Heat, Puppet, Ansible, lots of different things. Right? Um, and that's all good in the sense that we're playing to the strengths of each of these tools. Right? But it also introduces quite a lot of complexity. Right? So if things go wrong, sometimes it can be hard to diagnose the source of the failure. Right? So the goal here is to essentially um, provide a cleaner set of tools, right? uh, or essentially less tool proliferation, I guess. Right? And to essentially rebase it all purely on Ansible. Right? Uh, also, we know from experience, from talking to our customers, and we know our customer base very well, that upgrades, historically, has not been a particularly pleasant experience with our product. Right? And part of the reason for that is the disruption to workloads in the data plane. Right? Now, it's improved immeasurably over time. Right, the actual um, process itself is is very is rock solid now and very extensively tested. Right, but it still has one real kicker as far as uh, many of our customers are concerned, and that's the requirement to do a reboot cycle across your entire compute tier. Right, when you're doing an upgrade, so you move to and essentially this is caused by moving to a new version of the operating system. Right. So you have to move. Uh, generally, we have aligned versions of OpenStack and RHEL. Uh, and generally, when you do an upgrade, you know, essentially up to now, you've been forced to move these two things in lockstep. Right? So you move to a new version of OSP. You also move to a new version of RHEL. Right? Booting into the new kernel requires you to either you know, do a cold restart in your workloads or go through that complicated live migration dance that nobody loves. Right? Um, and that's essentially the thing that continues to make upgrades something that would be a point of friction for our customers, right? So one element here that I think will be quite transformative in terms of addressing that pain point is giving customers the option to essentially decide the pace at which they move to the new version of RHEL, right? And to do that gradually within their data plane. Right? So you can imagine a case where your compute tier is, say, 100 nodes, right? and you decide initially to move 20% of those to the new version of RHEL. Right? And then you open a new maintenance window two months down the road. You move another 20%. And you continue doing that pattern of moving your uh, groups of maybe in groups of racks or whatever to the new version of RHEL, doing it gradually within fairly limited maintenance windows. Right? And it also gets around the problem that many customers have that the applications that they're running, 
for example, VNFs within their data plane might only be certified for a particular version of RHEL, right? And the ability to leave behind subgroups of their computes on the older version of RHEL can be very kind of convenient in the context of that kind of certification lag, right? Now, one thing that I think is very, uh, you know, definitely should be emphasized here is that the data plane will remain external to OpenShift, even though we're re-platforming chunks of our product on OpenShift or giving people the option to do that, right? The data plane will remain external to OpenShift. Now, that's for a very deliberate and intentional reason, right? And it's based essentially on lifecycle, right? So one of the big points of value that our customers get from the way we approach lifecycle, and when I say we, I mean both the Red Hat OpenStack product and RHEL operating system, is the ability to continue running the same point version of RHEL for many years, right? You know, for two, three, four, five years even, right? So basically, that kind of longevity, right, and that stability, uh, and the ability not to upgrade uh, to a, a, a new major version of the operating system over an extended period of time would be viewed as a major point of value, right? And that's why we're keeping the data plane external to OpenShift, right? So we'll continue to offer that uh, value to our customers. Um, right, so you look at all of those changes, right? You might ask yourself the question if you're an experienced Red Hat OpenStack platform customer, right? Okay, so you've got all of these things changing. That's got to be only for Greenfield, am I right? right? Well, no. Okay, so we realize that basically restricting this to greenfield-only deployments and not giving people the option to evolve their pre-existing deployments wouldn't really be a good option for, a group, for uh, many of our customers, right? So they're in a scenario where they have an existing footprint, right? And they need to be able to evolve that, those existing deployments to the new form factor, right? Without having to do a, a clean rebuild, in a, uh, essentially, right? So to facilitate that, Right, we have basically, um, within engineering, come up with a solution, right? And we're calling this adoption, right? So the idea is very simple, really, at a, at a conceptual level. So you have an existing um, deployment, right? Uh, and basically, what you do is you come along and you build out a fresh control plane, right? You then take the knowledge of the workloads that are currently running in your compute here, in your data plane, right? And you essentially inject that knowledge into the freshly built out control plane. And that freshly controlled, uh, built out control plane would be of the new form factor, right? So it would be hosted on OpenShift, yeah? Uh, so now your new control plane knows all about the workloads, right? And essentially, the old control plane, con control plane is, is no longer required for all intents and purposes, right? And you may still have some services that are still running there. For example, you might have had some Cephmons or something of that nature. Right, that you might have to keep some of that hardware around, but it's essentially repurposed, right? The guts of your control plane are now recast in the new form factor, right? And the, uh, the beauty part of all of this is that it happened with essentially zero disruption to your workloads, right? All of your VMs continue to run as before, all of your networks continue to pass data around as before, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's, the point here essentially is this is not for Greenfield only, despite the fact that the form factor of the product will change significantly, right? It can still be uh, applied in cases where you're essentially uh, upgrading from, from a pre-existing deployment. Um, okay, I think I skipped two there. Uh, okay, yep, so let me illustrate this. Uh, <laughs> you, I'm a bit of a visual thinker here, so it always makes more sense to me when I see a picture, right? Uh, so imagine you've got a case where you've got a, a traditional form factor deployment of Red Hat OpenStack platform, right? So you've got your uh, controllers, um, and that's, they're running all of the uh, uh, control plane services in the normal way. And you've got, just for illustration here, I'll just put two computes, but in realistic terms, that would probably be 100, 200, whatever number, right? So that all runs fine, it's all running directly on bare metal, and that's the existing shape of the product that we've had through, whatever, 16 major releases up to now, right? So essentially, the adoption mechanism will work like this. First off, you need an OpenShift, right? Because the whole point of this is to re-platform 
a, a, a chunk of your, of your OpenStack um, product on OpenShift to, to take advantage of the more modernized uh, Kubernetes operational experience. And that OpenShift has its own form factor, right? It's got masters, it's got workers, and so on, right? Um, the actual control plane uh, elements are represented using the, the kind of dark blue um, rectangles up at the top there and the, running on the worker nodes, right? And these are essentially sets of fine-grained podified control plane services. So things like your Cinder volume service, your Nova API service, your Nova placement service, your Glance API service, that kind of stuff, right? And that's all distributed right across your cluster, right? Now, initially, that's totally empty, right? It's a control plane, but it's not, it doesn't really have a purpose, right? It's not doing any useful work for you. It doesn't know about any compute capacity, right? Uh, the next step then, essentially, is to take a representation of uh, the data, right, that basically describes fully the uh, workloads the, uh, that are running on your, your compute there, and essentially inject knowledge of those workloads into the Podify control plane, right? So the Podify control plane essentially takes over the management of those workloads without disrupting the workloads themselves, right? And it's that without disruption point, right, uh, that I think is, is transformative about this, this idea. Now, once you've achieved that, the purpose of the old control plane nodes is essentially, um, you know, they've come to the end of their useful life, right? So you can uh, repurpose um, those control plane nodes, and from, you know, that point forward, all management of the actual uh, workloads and lifecycle and so on is all mediated via the freshly built out control plane uh, of the new form factor. Um, so that's essentially where we're going to be, um, and we're working towards that, right? Um, now, no good presentation is complete without a, a call to action, right? So uh, basically, even though this was very product oriented, you know, very much built into Red Hat's DNA is the open source model of development, right? So we're gonna be working on all of this in you know, fully open way, as we always do. All the work we do is, is, is essentially done in the open, right? Um, and one thing we really wanna build on is our large customer base and their knowledge of the challenges and the problems and uh, the different um, things that they're facing, right? So we're gonna be making a sequence of very regular tech preview drops right, of different tranches of these features uh, as we work on building them out on the engineering side, right? And our hope and expectation here is that our customers will work with us, right? And they'll pick up these drops, maybe uh, deploy them in their staging environment or in pre-prod, basically give us some feedback, right, on, you know, what we're doing right, you know, what's actually working for them and how they'd like to see it evolve, right? And that'll be super helpful for us to, to guide our kind of our technical direction here and to help us kind of course correct as we go, right? So that's uh, essentially uh, the engineering vision on this. I'll hand you back to my colleague, Maria. Yeah, so basically to close out, we talked about our strategy, where we're going, where everything is uh, kind of working together. We talked about our customers and some of their um, use cases and some of their deployment models. We talked about our strategy also being influenced by their feedback. And with that, I want to invite you to later this week to come to this talk where we're going to talk to Proximus. Um, they run OpenShift on OpenStack, so we'll like you know, they will be speaking about their experience. You will hear directly from the operator and how all of these comes, uh, all of these technologies come together. Um, that's it. This is it for us. Uh, we're going to open it for questions now. Thanks. <laughs> Good one. Yeah, go for it. I think there's a mic over there, if you don't mind, but you can just scream the question. We were talking, I'm, I'm going to repeat to see. We were talking about the migration work. How much is that manual work? How much is that automated? You're talking about migration on maybe uh, adoption. So this yeah. uh, compute adoption. Um, we're building this feature, 
So it is not automated today, for sure. Um, obviously, the goal for us, uh, more than just automation, is to make sure that uh, there's no impact to the workloads. That's sort of the clear principles that we have. Uh, and the other uh, second goal would be that there's a rollback procedure or there's a way to back out if something you know, is just not adopted correctly. And, and then the third is that uh, in most use cases or some of the use cases that I've talked about were around telco. Telco windows are four hours, uh, including time to set up, do the thing, and then roll back. So that has to happen within four hours. Uh, all of this, um, all of these uh, kind of uh, goals are, are kind of met. So automation will be high on the list. Uh, and in addition to that, and maybe Owen can expand, we will be using um, OpenShift to sort of manage the computes here and then leveraging Ansible to do the automation for uh, then the management of the compute tier once that is adopted to the new con compute tier. Um, Ansible is very good at automation. <laughs> So that, that would be something that we definitely will leverage for, for that. Owen? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just to reinforce what Maria said, the plan here is for it to, the whole point is to make it a more convenient mechanism, right? So the plan would be for it to be a smoothly op, uh, automated, uh, relatively painless operation for you to apply. Yeah? So we're going to leverage on things like the operator framework, we're going to leverage Ansible, uh, the mechanism as it currently exists is more of a proof of concept, so there are manual aspects of it, but the eventual productized version of it will be highly automated. Also, another thing, this uh, management of OpenStack uh, using Kubernetes, it, it's not new for the community. We understand this is not like fresh innovation. Uh, why didn't we do it that before? It's because we just didn't have an easier and gentle way to bring our customers on this journey. Right? We couldn't just rely on doing it greenfield only, like Owen was talking about, like just for fresh new deployments, because we don't leave customers behind. Um, so migrating and having uh, adoption, being able to roll back to an existing control plane, so like no control plane outage, right? There's actually two control planes, you can always come back here. All of those things are in uh, you know, the forefront of, for us to think about this technology. Other questions? Yes, go for it. So during this migration step, you said you do that without disruption. I would assume you wouldn't have to freeze the other control plane first. So yep. while your pay plane yep. is continue working, you would stop the to make changes in your open stack without the control plane that during yep. the migration. Yep. So uh, that's a good point. Let me just repeat the question there. So what did we really mean by without disruption, right? So the like you could say um, Disruption, basically, as I was describing it, was more around the actual existence of the VMs, right? And they're continuing their ability to do work, right? Uh, but if you were to have a very strict version of disruption, right, you would probably count a period of API outage where it's not possible to spin up new VMs. It's not possible to make structural changes to your cloud, right? So there will realistically be a brief period where essentially you will not be able to do uh, some API operations, right? But it'll be relatively brief and measured in terms of seconds and minutes, right, as opposed to hours and days, right? Uh, the workloads themselves, though, will be completely non-disrupted, and that's, like, that's non-negotiable. That's the whole point of doing this, is to have a, have a scenario whereby your, uh, the value you're getting from your cloud, right, will continue unabated during this process. And I, I would just like to point out that this description of the process that we are doing, uh, again, heavily influenced by telcos where SLAs are really high and workloads sometimes cannot even be moved. Like you cannot touch it, they're in a remote location, et cetera. Uh, however, if there's a customer or a scenario where moving workloads or migrating them to a new hardware because it is time for a hardware refresh. It has been five years since we had hardware. We have additional CapEx and we want the latest and greatest uh, you know, hardware accelerators and whatnot and we have the cash to roll out a new deployment. By all means, we have the means to help migrate workloads when that's needed. It's just that's an easier target <laughs> than achieving this. But that is also possible. So what we're bringing in is sort of new possibilities to, you know, with less disruption. Um, 
Also, I would point out that while we were talking about this not being triple O, at this point, Raja has no plans to discontinue investment in triple O. So this is not a substitution, this is an and today. So we obviously expect customers that are running with it to continue uh, upgrading that path. This just brings another, um, you know, really a true hybrid cloud where both OpenStack and OpenShift live together. You can expand on one side or, uh, on, or the other, whether it's more cloud native workloads, whether it is more um, existing workloads that need to um, scale, uh, some that you need to keep on-prem. Once you bring in OpenShift into the mix, that opens up to just a whole other universe of hybrid. Yes? What are the specific reasons we don't want to do this for the data plane? Okay, great question. Um, some, when, when you are in, in this scenario, you could make the case that computes can also run on the OpenShift side, right? Because you see, uh, I think worker zero, yeah, there's a worker zero right there that doesn't see, uh, is uh, OSP infrapod, uh, control plane, contr well, we're saying four control plane, but you could, you could have three control plane and you can have another one that's just uh, a traditional worker node. And you could essentially run comp OpenStack compute over there. Fully agreed. OpenShift uh, today has a life cycle that is between 18 to two years, 18 months to two years, and does require a quicker kind of turnaround and upgrade. If the workloads are sort of more cloud native and can take the churn of those two years life cycles, you can absolutely grow. You can, you can scale that sort of to the left, no problem whatsoever. However, we work with a lot of customers that have workloads that have to be certified on a specific version of the operating system, so they're very tied to RHEL and RHEL components, and that certification process is long, and it is disruptive, so customers usually say, no, I need this to be supported for a longer period of time. I'm gonna run through a certification process with partners and with the vendors of the particular workloads, and I need this to make sense of my investment, so I need it supported for, say, four years, five years. And that's where we, it's tr sort of traditional OpenStack with the REL, life cycle, REL OpenStack lifecycle, which is longer, four to five years, versus a two-year. That's the main reason. Exactly, yeah. So just to build on what Maria was saying, it's technically possible to do, of course, and we've actually done it. Like, so we had a long-running long proof-of-concept project where we did exactly what you were proposing, right? Um, the, the point is, though, it's all about life cycle, right? And it would be a different life cycle experience where the compute was internally hosted with an open shift, and it's not what the majority of our customers want. I would, I would expand to say also, it's all about the workloads. Like, the workloads are the ones that are dictating what is the infrastructure that I need to have to be able to support this, and what are the workloads that I have today, what are the workloads that are coming tomorrow? Any other questions? Great questions, by the way. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly what we were <laughs> thinking, which is, yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Have a great another day. Cool. Nice I job. I need to stop bowing. I'm Sorry. just like, thank you. And I immediately <laughs> bow and, and I you're catch right on time. Look, 40 minutes. Yep.